But who are you? I repeated. Are you a ghost? As I uttered my frightened question, she let out a loud sigh. And as I stared into the grayness, I saw her face begin to change. The eyes closed and her cheeks began to droop. Her gray skin appeared to fall, to melt away. It drooped like cookie batter, like soft clay. It fell onto her shoulders, then tumbled to the floor. Her hair followed, falling off in thick clumps. A silent cry escaped my lips as her skull was revealed, her gray skull. Nothing remained of her face except for her eyes, her gray eyes which bulged in the open sockets, staring at me through the darkness. Stay away from my piano, she rasped. I'm warning you, stay away. You can't scare me Not with the basement of black and me Maybe a sentient dummy Calling a creep Boo dudes! Whoa! Welcome to Calling All Creeps, the podcast about goosebumps. I'm your host, Matt, here with my co-host and co-master of Scaramonies, Dave. Yeah, that's yeah. me. I'm scaring some monies. Hell yeah. Just like Billy Idol. How are all you cute little Steinheads doing? Can't hear you. Pretty I good. assume you're doing great. That's right. Coming to you live from two separate locations. <laughs> Our respective living rooms. Uh, I'm in my bedroom. I'm actually in my quote unquote dining room, which is really a place to just put all my shit like a, <laughs> well, a desk and like a drum and like an amp. Yeah. But isn't that kind of what a, an apartment is? Yeah. I mean, what do you do? You know, you don't have like a basement or a garage or like a star. Um, we have no closets. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Fucking that... old, old house. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm actually thinking about swapping my living room with my bedroom for the the summer you have a cool nice spacious bedroom with a door that leads directly into it yeah from the outside the only problem is like readers uh you know sound off in the comments below is it weird if someone comes to hang out with me and you have to walk through my bedroom to get to my living room Hmm. or also neither of them have doors neither of them have doors so regardless it's an open it's an open concept in yeah, a way. Which is nice. It's very modern. And there's a very big closet that would be in my living room, but like, whatever, I can get my clothes from my living room. Yeah. I live alone. It's just me and two dang cats. That's right. Dave, I think the listeners want to know, how are your cats doing? Well, I just vacuumed, which was well needed. Also, I, I combed out Chainsaw. He's good. He's skulking around. Cool. But Dirt Bike, she does not like... She does not like that vacuum, so she's hiding under the oven. She's been there. What time is it now? <laughs> yeah, she's been there for about uh, probably around forty-five minutes now. Yeah, I was I was saying <clears throat> I also have a little a little cat boy, and he uh, we call it actually the vacuum, and he's very scared <laughs> of the vacuum. Uh, and as I just told Dave, he also hates landscaping. It's his number one fear. The if, when the weed whacker comes out, he's behind the couch for two hours. Um, um, so speaking of cats, goosebumps. <laughs> That's right. Scaredy cats. So, uh, let's yeah, just, just, let's just go we, into it, right? Let's just go into it. There's been some time between recordings. We were so ahead and now we're so behind. We're so behind. But... Well, we had, uh, there was a holiday. Happy belated Passover and Easter to all yeah. you folks. And if you're an so atheist, decided... hey, happy Sunday. Yeah. Happy Game of Thrones. That's right. That was a damn good episode. Um, yeah, it was not bad. That's how I feel uh, about Game of Thrones in general. But I can't shit on that fandom when I'm so excited about like Avengers. You know? Yeah. It's like the same principle, just like a monolithic property. Well, that's why I think we should just switch the episode and instead wait for this weekend to happen and just do like a live episode of us talking about the winter war i don't know if they're calling it that once this shit drops in game of thrones and endgame and we just release that on monday that's cool do you want to see that instead okay stop recording right now and just put that out i think you guys know that you can fill in the blank here boo dudes bye yeah uh piano lessons can be murder unlucky number Uh, 13 of the series i'll give it a i'll give it a seven all right boo dudes bye bye i'll give it a 13 out of 100 (laughs) 
You hated it that much? No, it was okay. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. So my general statement before we begin, and we'll talk about time and place and all that shit. I, at first I, so Dave, you texted me and you said, this is a weird one. And I was like, I <clears throat> have no frame of reference because I haven't started it yet. And uh, I hated it for really? a couple chapters. Then I liked it a lot. Me too. For a okay. while. And then the end, I didn't like it as much, but it's not as, it's not as bad. It's certainly not the worst entry in the series and nor is it the worst ending of the series. Um, um, I think that the ending, we always say that the twist comes with there's like four pages left. Yeah. If the twist came 15, 20 pages earlier and it let him really flesh out the character that the twist is based around, I think it would have been a fun one. 100% agree. I think that's, <clears throat> we won't give away the ending yet, but that's that's the issue is like it turned on a dime and then you have to buy this premise. and. There were a few more pages than usual even, but it was yeah. just too quick. And it was so, because actually to Stein's credit, this is really inventive. There's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of layers to this. There's like yeah. three different villains, but ultimately there's like one, but there's a lot of threats happening at once. And then it all just culminates at once and it's just too much, you know? It also doesn't fit any sort of genre or played out horror plot. I mean, no. you're always like, ooh, spooky camp outdoors or yeah. haunted house or like the threat and the main topic is something that's not really talked about, but very growing up 90s. Yeah. It's did you ever take out. piano lessons? Um, no. My sister did and had a piano, so I, I dabbled with that, but I am, you know, I can't play the piano. How about you? Yeah, but you're a musician. Uh, Sure. No, you are. <laughs> you got to look up his I stuff. I own a it's guitar. Great. No. He has many recordings. Oh. Don't make me put... He, I mean, listen to our theme song. That's all Matt. Ooh, baby. That's right. And Bailey School Dropouts theme song. He mm -hmm. churned out in like a... We put it out there into the text zosphere, and then all of a sudden Matt had a theme song. It was great. I have very little time on... Or a lot of time on my hands is what I meant. I, I don't know, but um, I took piano lessons. I was super excited to do it because I wanted to learn an instrument. And the reason I was super excited is because I realized that if I took piano lessons, I didn't have to play soccer. <laughs> That's great. Did you play? Did you play soccer? Yeah, well, I was really young. During okay. This. But I hated soccer. I did too. I played it for a while and I did not like it. Basically, I was running back and forth. And then the ball would come up. And basically, when you're a kid playing soccer, it's you stand in a circle yeah. and all kick each other in the shins while yeah. this like ball popcorns around. And you have shin so, guards and you take them off and they smell like cheese. You and that? I was like, fuck that shit. And yeah. I just like ran and then waited on the outside as they kicked. And then when it went to the other side, I, I ran that way. <laughs> Meanwhile, then I learned how to play piano and I, I had fun doing it. My piano actually is something that I have still in my collection it's um it was given to me by my grandfather oh, on that's my cool. mom's side polish grandpa it is made by nintendo really it's weird that well i think there was another company that had to do with it but they manufactured a piano like a, a synth pretty much okay. that um you could plug into your nes and came with a game that would teach you piano that's cool Weirdly enough, I have it. I wish I could find the game. It's probably somewhere in my parents' house. I hope they didn't throw it out because we never owned an NES growing up. Yeah. I only acquired one later in life. I but... didn't either. I was a Sega boy. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. No, I was always... I'm Nintendo till the day I die. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we started at... Well, I started at Game Boy Pocket, then Super Nintendo, and then never left, man. Hell yeah. Never left. I got, like, 100 Game Boys. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen some of your collection. It's impressive. Somebody once commented, uh, my bedside table, like next to my bed. Yeah. Literally, it's just, it's like one box of condoms and <laughs> I think like 13 Game Boys. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mix those up. Uh, no, I do. But, <laughs> all right, so Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. This came out in November 1993. Cool. Uh... So let's say the tagline is an allusion to uh, play it again, Sam, from Casablanca. Mm -hmm. It says play it again, Hans. But 
actually, weird thing I learned is that that's not the real quote from Casablanca. What is it? It's just, I don't know what the real one is, but apparently that's like, people just like fuck it up. Okay. It just, uh, but that's, one of those, mis- like people just don't pull it right. Yeah. It's like the burn stain bears. Everyone right. thinks it's one thing, but it's not. But anyway, uh, and also this is going to make a lot of sense for you now knowing this, but it originally was not piano lessons can be murder. What was it, it was supposed to be guitar lessons can be murder. Oh shit. But everyone told RLS, they're like, dude, guitars aren't scary. <laughs> So he switched it to piano lessons. Pianos are spookier. They are. I I think they've been around longer. No, no, I don't know that. All right, ready? At the count of three. I'm going to count to three. You say the spookiest instrument. One, two, three. Kazoo. (laughs) Basically, the the oboe is just like a a more complex kazoo. It's a deep kazoo. (laughs) I'll give you a deep kazoo. I'll tell you what. Um... So there's that. Let's. Uh, so that's about the book, time and place. The song is "I Do Anything for Love" <gasps> by Meatloaf. Wow, incredible! What a good month. What a good month because we got the loafster. <laughs> Left us a nice loaf. Hey, I want to <laughs> shout out a uh, friend of the podcast, Brian. Um, oh, Brian, hell- I knew that yeah. song. He, he chides me uh, every week. He sends me a text message that says, not every week, but the past few weeks, that says, like, why didn't you know what that reference was, the song <laughs> was? You don't know who George Brett is? Listen, Brian. Sorry, I don't know a baseball player from 1980. All right? Uh, I know George Brett well, only because I knew that story about him shitty. <laughs> but but I, I'm I, really excited to have Brian on this pod. Yeah, absolutely. He can't back down now that we're um, saying it on the pod. Also, of course. A, uh, an original Goose Buddy, because he and I saw the first movie together whenever Aww. that came out in 2015 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then the movie is, uh, in the beginning, Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, very cool. But... That, of course, as most people know, a cult classic where it didn't do what was expected in the theaters. Right. And um, I usually go by what was the top grossing. Top grossing and second highest grossing movie of 93 next to Jurassic Park came out at the end of that month. Ms. Doubtfire. (gasps) Mrs. Doubtfire. I'll tell you what. If you don't say hello like Mrs. Doubtfire, I don't want you in my house. You have to come in and say hello. And it's crazy because you always have cream in your face. Oh, <laughs> producer Chib. Producer Chib coming in with a hello. Yeah, that's right. She knows the rules of the house. Yeah. Uh, so let's go into November 93. On uh, November 2nd, Roger Moore, as n- known as one of the James Bonds, Never had it. Uh, I'm not laughing about the James Bond. I'm laughing because he had an enlarged prostate removed. Oh. <laughs> It's funny because that's it, – it's not funny. It's funny that the website that I used to get these facts thought that was an important right. thing that happened yeah. in November. Damn, I can't believe they removed all his jizz that day. <laughs> On November 17th, the House of Representatives approved NAFTA. <laughs> <laughs> and then they approved a new prostate for James Moore. What's his name? Well, Roger we, Moore. Roger Moore. We all know what NAFTA stands for. Yeah, nasty asses farting today. <laughs> Always. <laughs> That's it. On November 18th, this is to go back to last episode, Vince McMahon was charged with steroid distribution. Oh, boy. Shocking no one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the worst humans I could think of. He's just like a corollary to Trump, right? I don't want to bring his name up on the podcast, but they seem like one in the same. They're carved out of the same kind of like shitty marble. Trump is in the WWE Hall of Fame. There you go. I mean, whatever. Birds of a feather. It's bullshit. Uh, so November of the 23rd, Donkey Style, the debut album by Snoop Dogg, was released. Okay, good for him. Crazy thing is that uh, it was the Billboard album of the year in 1994. Okay, it's a big deal. Yeah. I don't know. I have no opinion on Snoop Dogg. I think I've just been oversaturated with like exposure to him my whole life, and I don't really like follow him, so I'm just like, eh, I don't 
don't really care. He he fucking rules. I'm just gonna say that like, he he's really cool. Yeah, he seems cool, but I just I don't you know I got nothing. Oh, I got a text and oh. it made my whole desk sound like a fart. It um, nafted so, your, your desk. <laughs> it did. Uh, on November 30th, the NFL announces the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm-hmm. Oh, as which, a team. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a football guy, but I, I <laughs> literally I saw that and there, I like talked about the Mighty Ducks so many times that I was like, well, I should probably <laughs> shout throw them out a the bone. NFL. And this is to this is what I think is funny uh, about Mrs. Doubtfire um, <laughs> because on November 30th, Schindler's List is released, mm-hmm. which was the best picture of 1994. Right. Just like Doggy Style was the best album of '94, <laughs> but. Lost in the box office to Mrs. Stoutfire. <laughs> I mean, that's a hit. It's a it's a, it's a certified hit. hit. You got but like Schindler's List is like a beautiful film sure. about a real sad thing. Very but important. I just love that. Like, hello there. <laughs> oh, be careful! That pony had a lot of water. <laughs> well, want to see my impression of a hot dog? There's a lot of good Rest shit in peace, there. man. Rest in peace, Rob Williams. It's super sad, still. Yeah. I know Louie is very problem- problematic, but... Yeah, um, fuck Louie. Jacking off on his own stomach in front of everybody. But the, the episode of him and Robin Williams talking about showing up to each other's funerals. Yeah. Great episode. Great show. Really well written. I think a lot of people had to do with that other than him. Yeah. I just uh, wish I didn't have to hate it so much. But. <laughs> right. Um, so this here plot. Here's the first half of the book. There's a kid named Jerry. He's 12 classic goosebumps trope where they move to a new town jerry has to start at a new school um they move into this new house there's a piano in the attic um mm-hmm. they find the piano leave it up there then uh jerry decides like with the help of his parents maybe i should play that piano they move it downstairs that's the first half of the book also jerry has a cat and he hates it so he's a little piece of shit yeah um, but what's the cat's name uh, I forget. Buster. <laughs> it's bonkers. Bonkers. That's right. <laughs> That's the best part of the book. Yeah. Bonkers. Bonkers. So I, I just slow it down a little bit. First two sentences, I said we're back on our ship. I wrote down. Here's the first two sentences of the book, and it was just like the warm blanket of goosebumps being wrapped around my shoulders. Ooh, baby. It says, uh, I thought I was going to hate moving into a new house. But actually, I had fun. I played a pretty mean joke on mom and dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it's a classic. It's like Welcome to Dead House again. It is. And th- 13 books, not, I mean, when you look at the full 62, I mean, we're still in kind of the very, very early beginnings. But yeah. it was, it's been long enough. Yeah, I think it's fine. I just so page four is dedicated solely to dunking on the cat. The whole page. Can I read the page? Yes, you can. I just read the whole page. Okay. <laughs> let me say right out. Uh, let me say right out that Bonkers is not my favorite member of our family. In fact, I keep as far away from Bonkers as I can. No one ever explained to the stupid cat that she's supposed to be a pet. Instead, I think Bonkers believes she's a wild, man-eating tiger. Or maybe a vampire bat. Why? Her favorite trick is to climb up on the back of a chair or a high shelf and then leap with her claws out onto your shoulders. (laughs) I can't tell you how many good t-shirts have been ripped to shreds by this trick of hers or how much blood I've lost. The cat is nasty, just plain vicious. She's all black except for a white circle over her forehead, blah, 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 blah. Mom and dad like her. Bonkers usually scratches them and makes them bleed, but they never learn. When we moved to this new house, I was hoping maybe Bonkers would get left behind. (laughs) But no way. Mom made sure that Bonkers was in the car first, right next to me. And of course, the stupid cat threw up in the back seat. Whoever heard of a cat who gets car sick? Now he goes into like his Jerry Seinfeld routine. She did it deliberately because she's horrible and vicious. (laughs) <laughs> and it goes on to the next page, Dave. It's not done. It's not. Do you want to read it? Because I, I uh, highlighted the main phrases. We're on FaceTime right now. Do you see like the main ones oh, you yes. talked about? Yeah. Are all there? You but can, the next you paragraph. Anyway, I ignore, 
I ignored mom's request to keep an eye on her. In fact, I crept into the kitchen and opened the back door, hoping maybe Bonkers would run away and get lost. <laughs> and then he drops shitty. it. Yeah, very shitty. shitty. It doesn't set a good tone for his character. It makes me not like him. Which, as a matter of fact, I feel like the characters that we're supposed to like in the previous books have been shitty. We're kind of set up to not like this jokester, Mm -hmm. but kind of more likable than some of the others. I agree. This is what's interesting is the pivot where it's like, I don't really like Jerry. And then he becomes like reasonable and kind of innocuous. He doesn't have a sibling that like, you know, makes the writing bad where he's like, my little brother sure is a jokester. Like all that kind of shit. Instead, he just has an animal he calls stupid, which everybody call. If if there's a book where one of the characters goes to a zoo, I imagine it's going to be the longest book, and it's gonna be like stupid giraffe, stupid (laughs) rhino. I haven't seen We Bought a Zoo, but I'd like to imagine that's the script. It's Matt Damon screaming at animals. Speaking of script, I just want to go back and um, first episode we may have been a little unkind to uh, Matt Stein. Oh, because we called him blind? <laughs> we said some things. Uh, I mean, that's not I, a real, like, that's just us being insane. Dude was uh, helping write, and I don't know I don't know if he was the main writer, but he had a lot to do with uh, Beetlejuice the Musical. Oh, that's which right. Which just came out. Mm-hmm. So, uh, congrats, Matt Stein. Congrats, Matt Stein. <laughs> is your house burning down? Oh. I just hear beeping. Uh, producer Chip is making some food. Oh, I'm jealous. She's, is she going to deliver it to me? Are you going to deliver the food to Dave? No. No. Can I do a load of laundry? Yeah. She's going to do some yeah. laundry, too. That's fine. <laughs> How about, can Chib come in and let us know every single housely duty that you are not doing because you're too busy talking about jizz on Goosebumps? Yeah. Um, and then, next episode, we need to make sure that you fulfill your husbandly duties uh-huh. by doing the same. By uh, doing some domestic activities yeah well dave i'll have you know i did the dishes last night right correct producer chib yes did you do the laundry last time uh we intermittently do the laundry i just put in a load actually before we started yeah but i'm talking about the laundry (laughs) (laughs) don't touch my load (laughs) she wouldn't want to anyway okay so uh, <laughs> Is there a book? I don't even care. Who cares? Bye, <laughs> boo dudes. No, but J- Jerome or Jerry is kind of a cool dude. His cat. It's okay. To be fair, if we can do an award for shittiest animal, this is it. Bonkers is, may I say, bonkers. <laughs> what a correct name for the cat. Um, while we're talking about pages dedicated to stupid shit, uh, page 24. So I mentioned the first half of the book is just like seeing a piano and then moving it downstairs. Yep. Um, page 24 is all about the way in which two movers move the piano. It's like them getting a dolly and like rolling it down the stairs and how much it hurts their back and like all this shit. It's the entire page. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's called detail, man. I guess. And it's great because those movers come back later in the... No, they don't. No. But the only detail also on page 25 I wrote, too bad. Oh, uh, Bonkers almost got crushed under the piano. Yeah. And, and yeah, he says, too uh, bad. Too bad. I thought shaking my head. That dumb cat almost got what it deserved. Stupid. And then the men are back. They are back. It says the men were apologizing as they tried to catch their breath, mopping their foreheads with their red and white bandanas. Do you think they were both Bruce Springsteen? I was thinking uh, they were, like, trying to bring the Crips and Bloods together. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, that's nice. It is nice. That's why he was probably like, Red Bandit, oh, fuck, I need to make it, too. (laughs) So Snoop Dogg Doggy style just came out. People will know. Oh, hell yeah, nice. Um, Yeah, I I think I had more uh, notes in between. Actually, no, I really didn't. I just said Bonkers gets shit on. Uh, there's a piano in the attic that plays sad music. He hears it playing mm-hmm. music as he walks up and turns out it's just the piano. Pianos moves downstairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also said that dad is um, basically 
how Dave Chappelle acts um, when he plays a white guy. <laughs> sure. So he's very, like, uh, uptight. and He's just kind of like, well, son, it seems uh, you're doing a great day today right. with the sunshine. Oh, boy. Right. But. Um, yeah, so he does hear that music he he here's the piano playing in the attic so that is that's a spooky part to mention um, but when he goes up there of course nothing's there they move it downstairs this continues and then we can kind of go right into the first ghost sighting right well um he meets his piano instructor before the goat he sees the ghost for the first time yes okay yes yes so dr shriek comes over right doctor does he have a PhD? Do we have to establish this? I guess when you're just somebody who shows up at people's houses you just and teaches them piano. Give yourself make, a title. You can just give whatever title you want. Cool. You have a master's, right? Yeah. What title do you get with that? Do you get a cool title? Um, yeah, I get uh, Ugly Asshole. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah. It's That's a, a good one. Yeah, it's it's uh oh, oh <laughs> you naffed it again. Uh, I did. Yeah, it's it's Matthew Ryan, comma, UA for ugly asshole, and I paid forty thousand dollars for it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's cool, right? If you needed an ugly asshole, you just could have come here yeah. and I could have like painted a sad face. On it. <laughs> did you know that you can uh, you can enroll in school and pay uh, for a one to two year program, $40,000 to learn to read and then not get a job. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Okay. But it's good that we're letting the people. I just want to, you know, that should be the thing I promote today. Um, I'm just going to plug that right now. Well, that's bullshit because I went to the same school mm-hmm. and I got a creative writing degree. Yep. And now I work in IT. So it all <laughs> makes sense. It all works out. And good thing you uh, paid only. Uh, four times your salary to get that degree yeah that's pretty as fair. did I'm i pay- i'm still paying it off only nine years later yeah so that's same anyway wow. <laughs> jerry Have we even talked about the plot yet <laughs> well so dr so anyway, shriek, dr. Comes shriek yeah he looks like a santa claus and he's got a hand fetish yeah um so dr shriek decides he just needs to meet jerry Walk in, say, what's up? Mm -hmm. Here's some scales. (laughs) Yeah. Play them. Not reptile scales. I just want to meet you. I just want to make sure you got this piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the first interaction is just like, sit down, look at the piano, read this book, and I'll see you later. He just shows up. He just wants to check the hands. Yeah, he's just peeping those those hands. Which uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of. Cool. See how those uh, digits develop. Yeah. He pulled on his coat and came back to where I was sitting. I think you'll be an excellent student, Jerry, he said, smiling. I muttered thanks. I was surprised to see that his eyes had settled on my hands. Excellent. Excellent, he whispered. (laughs) Felt a sudden chill. I think it was the hungry expression on his face. What's so special about my hands, I wondered. Why does he like them so much? It was weird. Definitely weird. But of course, I didn't know how weird. Ugh. Right. So this also made me think, like, I had to stop and, and I just started thinking about foot fetishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he also says, like, you have magnificent hands. You were meant to play piano. Look at those hands. Yeah. God damn it. Yeah. Okay. My phone is just, I got, like, a Huffington Post thing. I don't even know how to turn that <laughs> off. But, um... Yeah, I've never, I never understood foot fetish. I don't want to kink shame, but no, I mean, yeah, whatever you're into, it's not my thing, but I see it on the internet. I mean, <laughs> I never see it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, ex- uh, someone I was seeing, I was just be like, how does that even work? Because like, don't you just get kicked in the balls a bunch? Mm, maybe. And they were like, yeah, that's good. kind of how it works. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. Look. Well, I how get much it. is it gonna cost? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to punish my balls. Please do. <laughs> I was like, I was going to say something, but I just want to hear you end this <laughs> right, sentence. Yeah. Well, as soon as you know that 95% of the things I say begin 
uh, and there's no ending. And by 95, I mean 100%. All right. So we're uh, half an hour into this podcast, okay. and I still don't think Good. we know the ball. Well, plot. we got to the ball stomping, so that's what's important. It is. So um, then that night, well, let's see. The pe- uh, Specs his hands. He's a pervert. Um, this is what I wrote the piano plays by itself yes Um, he goes downstairs to uh, try and this is when he gets the courage after it plays I guess it did play before you you were saying and he is slowly making his way into the living room because that's where they moved it Uh, and then bonkers the fights him. That's right. He jumps on him. He gets pushed down. Um, this is when he still doesn't see what's going on at the piano. He just see. He just hears it. Yeah. Um. And you know, Bonkers jumps on him. He gets scared. He screams. Mom and Dad come down, and they're like, "You're a stupid idiot." Um. And that's that's kind of it. Then he's back in school, and he's with his buddy Kim Lee Chin. Yeah. A. Uh, I don't know, extra character who appears twice and is really just a means to scare him about Dr. Shriek. So whenever Jerry mentions Dr. Shriek to um, Kim Lee, she gets freaked out. So this first occasion when he mentions it, she just kind of like, she's pleasant at first. And then after she mentions Dr. Shriek, uh, he, she disappears. She yeah, tries she's to like, get out of there. See you, bitch. Yeah. And she just fucking runs. Yeah. And then we're back with Dr. Shriek, the next chapter. And it, that chapter, it, I guess it's worth noting, begins with excellent hands. Excellent, Dr. Shriek declared. Thanks, I replied awkwardly. Um, Play it carefully, my boy, slowly and carefully. Concentrate on your fingers. Each finger is alive. Remember, alive. And then he says, my fingers are alive, I repeated, staring down at them. What a weird thought, I told myself. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, and that ends up being... Uh a dream, right? Right. Yeah. So, so what happens is he makes he's like faster, faster, yeah. faster to the point where he's playing so fast he doesn't even know how he's doing it, and then he looks down and has no control over his hands whatsoever. Yeah. And then he wakes up scared. Yeah. And I like this whole thing. I like. Yeah. I mean, he's done this before, but I I like that this dream, and I like that he wakes up and it's like a cold gray night, and he like talks to himself in the middle of the night. He says, oh, it's still Friday night, I said aloud. The sound of my voice helped me, uh, helped bring me out of the dream. And this is where he hears the notes again. He goes downstairs, and what happens? He's like, fuck it. He's also, as a character, he comes into his own because if something scary happened, we always talk like, we, we used to play the rationalization game yeah. and things were a little bit more ridiculous to the point where like I hear something happening. I'm not fucking going there. No, I would never. <laughs> but this is his new house. Stuff's been going on. He refuses to go down there over and over and over again. But this is the only book that really rationalizes why he goes down to see it. And the only character that I'm kind of like, yeah, dude, go for it. Yeah. And he's so does. he's had enough. So he finally goes down there. And this is weird coming from a guy who he's in the beginning. He's like, I love pranks. Yeah. And at one point it says that falling down is one of his hobbies. (laughs) That's right. He does say that. It's insane. He once he gets the piano, the first thing he notices is how slippery the bench is. And instead of practicing piano, he practice like he practices falling off of the bench over and over right. again. He's like, good, I can use this later. Yeah. He's like, this is my thing. I'm like a gag guy. Yeah. But that. He's like the, the Dexter of whoopee cushions. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because that it's interesting because that part of him disappears. We see that in the beginning. He's established as like a jokester. And then it, yeah. that slowly dies as he gets sort of wrapped up in all this muck and mire. Which is so good. Like he's good. a kid. Who moved and he's like, whatever, new experiences, fuck it, I'm not happy. But once shit gets real, he gets real. Yeah. Like, he's not still making fart jokes and, like, falling. I was so afraid he was going to, like, fall off the bench to beat the monster or something. Right. I was like, I swear to God, if he, like, he like glues a nickel to the floor and pranks right. away the ghost, yeah. he's like, I was going to be pissed. I'm going to give this ghost my best bit. Um, 
but actually this is where shit gets pretty real so he he goes downstairs to check it out and this time there is someone sitting at the bench um do you want to hit us with that description dave sure that's page 53 by the way my book um while tj who owned it originally had a dope signature look at that so my we're facetiming right now and it says poor connection the video will resume automatically when the connection improves no! so i'm just listening to you right now oh tj rules tj has a dope thing the only thing is that his parents smoked a lot oh yeah to the point where every single time i finished reading this book i had to pure all my hands because it smelled <laughs> like i had smoked a cigarette whoops sorry tj um hope you're doing all right so he sees a ghost yep it's a woman um she's playing the piano a woman who are you what are you doing here my high-pitched tight voice startled me the words came flying out almost beyond my control she stopped playing and opened her eyes she stared hard at me studying me her smile faded quickly her face revealed no emotion at all i stared back into the gray it was like looking at someone in a heavy, dark fog. With the music stopped, the house had become so quiet, so terrifyingly quiet. Who are you, I repeated. Quiet and sound in this book? So well done. Yeah. Well, this is what I like, too. It's There are scenes in this book where R.L. talks about the snow falling outside, and he takes his time with it, and he he establishes that, like, oh, we're expecting weather, and then he'll talk for a few paragraphs about, like, Dr. Shriek in the house or whatever, and then he'll say, oh, it's coming down heavy, and there's, like, a silence. You know, like, when there's a, your initial snowfall and things are sort of muted outside, and that's, like, the, yeah. the environment you're in here, and it's the middle of the night in the winter. It's a spooky... He does a good job establishing that. He does. Um, so he sees this lady and she says, this is my house. The whispered words seemed to come from far away. So soft, I wasn't sure I heard them. I don't understand, I choked out, feeling a cold chill at the back of my neck. What are you doing here? My house, came the whispered reply. My piano. But who are you? This is when shit gets real. Probably yes. <clears throat> the most graphic horror scene we've had since uh dead house yeah. pretty much since book one agree this is another parallel to dead house like exactly what's happening here as i stared into the grayness i saw her face begin to change the eyes closed cheeks began to droop her gray skin appeared to fall to melt away um but this also we read this in the beginning right so we did but i mean it's it, I would say, so I stopped the reading at Stay Away. I would say after that, it says, I backed up and turned away from the hideous rasping skull. I tried to scramble away, but my legs didn't cooperate. I fell, hit the floor on my knees. I struggled to pull myself up, but I was shaking too hard. <clears throat> Stay away from my piano. The gray skull glared at me with its bulging eyes. Um, and then he screams for mom and dad. And uh, she says, this is my house, my piano. And in all caps, it says, stay away. Um a threat yeah more so than some of the other books this is something where the ghost comes in and just fucking plops their dick down yeah right onto your piano and the melting dick no less right yeah like, if this so just obviously we're we could not be more removed from this and it's a children's book and whatever but like imagine experiencing any kind of paranormal event Never mind one where the thing that manifests or whatever your fear is manifests before you. And then that's scary, right? Because that's foreign. That's not supposed to be there. And then it melts and it's like just bones talking at you and just screaming in your face. Yeah. Like it's, it's also, horrendous. A skeleton that still has his eyes is so fucked. Right. It's very Crypt Keeper. Nobody likes that. No. So, um, so that's, that's where we are. And it's, you know, in the beginning of that chapter, the woman is established as sort of pretty, uh, per, yeah. per Jerry's evaluation. Um, and then, you know, she's bones. Mom and dad come down, <clears throat> say like, maybe you should see a psychiatrist. I, uh, start this. This is the first time in all of Goosebumps that the parents act responsibly yeah. and realistically. Agreed. 
It's to the point where they come into their kid who they just moved into a new house on the ground screaming at the piano they came they brought downstairs and they're like, "Hey, that's fine. We're gonna you're gonna see a doctor, right? Like of they course. care about this child. It's not like and also they do the part where they are." you're a prankster you're a yeah, jokester he has that and we get this before where they're like you're just a kid we don't understand how you feel blah but this is one where he's his hobby is falling down yeah to be a jokester but they turn this like they flip the switch so fast to the point where he is seeing a psychiatrist the next scene that's yeah. where Dr. Fry comes in. Well, so, and and one thing I just want to point out, just as in this chapter, just as his parents come down and they are reasonable and say, you should go to a psychiatrist, Jerry is also being reasonable for the first time on page 58, because this is the fear, right? If you experience something like this, or even, I mean, I'm sure you could make jumps, either are analogs that aren't paranormal or whatever, just you want to be believed and this trauma doesn't leave you right away. And that's, that's yeah. what he talks about because he's like, he says, I made my way across the living room to the front stairs. I was so angry. I wanted to hit something or kick something. I was really insulted too. Um, but my anger turned to fear. The ghost had vanished from the family room. What if she was waiting for me up in my room? What if I walked into my room and the disgusting gray skull with bulging eyeballs was staring at me from my bed? Um, she's in there. She's in there waiting for me. I knew it. I knew she'd be there. Yeah, because you just saw like a ghost that melted downstairs. So it's not just gone. Like you're going to go to sleep now where it lives. So yeah, in a new house, this isn't like the safety of your room. Yeah. You're still in its domain. Exactly. It's terrifying. RLS. I'm, this probably broke my top three. Yeah. I, I think it's up there for me as well. Um, taking into this is this is the interesting like territory we explore is like if he wrote this book for us as 30 year olds then it would probably be basically a home run because it's for kids we can't evaluate it totally honestly without incorporating like this other perspective and sort of remembering that fact so i guess this is the MO of this podcast, so this is obvious, but to, to does this accomplish what it's supposed to do for the reading group? And I, I think it does. Like, the criticisms I have are because it's for kids. It, that I agree with that, too. And I think a lot of this is the remembering of what it was to be a kid and the traumas of small things that we look back at as an adult. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is through a kid's eyes. It's more looking back at a trauma. That's how I saw it. Yeah. But I guess that goes back into uh, our final portion. Well, when we go into the writing, but yeah. Um, so he goes to Dr. Fry. Dr. Fry uh, says he's okay. Mm-hmm. Says that the, the human mind is a little nuts and whatnot. Yeah, he's and, understanding. You know, it's says you're not just crazy. what it is. You're not crazy. It's, Basically, what you expect from a psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, I've been there. Same. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's it's very helpful, even mm. if you don't need it. You, mental health is important. Yeah. So, um, so he goes to uh, Dr. Shriek's school. Right. Because his hands were good enough. He gets <laughs> invited there, and it's across town. Yeah. At that point, he almost gets eaten by uh, a robo-sweeper. <laughs> <laughs> There's a monster, and I'm like, it's probably just, like, a cart being pushed. Because uh-huh. he's like, it's a monster. It has eyes. It's going to eat me. And usually in RLS, it's like, oh, turns out it was a broom with a hat on it. Mm-hmm. This is legit, uh, like, a Zamboni for hallways yeah. with a face on it. And Dr. Shriek is there suddenly, and he says, are you admiring our, or he says, you are admiring our floor sweeper? You're what? I managed to choke out our floor sweeper. It is rather special. So basically what this comes down to is there's another guy at the school. There are two humans that Jerry sees the whole time he's at the school. One is Dr. Shriek and the other is uh, Mr. Toggle. Who Who is an inventor. Yes. Uh, Only thing about this book is both names, pretty, pretty much bullshit. <laughs> yes. Very much pulled like in half a second. He was like, oh, Dr. Toggle. And Dr. Scream, now Shriek. 
I feel like these names are like Skylanders or something. Like these names are like shitty kid meant for kids video games. Yeah. Like like Mr. Toggle is the one who like builds turrets and yeah. like Dr. Shriek is the one who screams loud music Mis- at the Mr. end. Mr. Toggle is like the alternate name for Clippy the Paperclip in Microsoft Word. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and actually, Dr. Shriek refers to him as our janitor and says, uh, Mr. Toggle is a mechanical genius. We couldn't do a thing without him. We really couldn't. Um, then it's kind of dropped for a while. They have their first lesson there at the school. Um, Mr. Toggle does make an appearance. Um, at some point um, because Jerry can't find his way out of the school. So Mr. Toggle helps him, says this way. Um, Also sets the scene by saying there's a lot of rooms and when he walks to the building, it's like a wall of sound, all the mm -hmm. pianos playing at once. And then he just looks into the windows and sees teachers nodding their heads. and, And music. Yeah. Later he says that one of the weird things about heading there and coming back is that he never sees any students Mm -hmm. and that the lessons and the pianos that he hears, like, he walks in and hears them playing and leaves and hears them playing. But, like, why are there lessons going on when he shows up and still going on when he leaves? Like, why isn't he bumped into anyone else? And that's cool kind of a little, little detail there. Yeah. Um, I also want to say, just so we don't forget, that peppered in at home, um, here and there in different chapters, there will be spooky shit still happening with the piano. So, like, for example, on page 85, um, mom and dad want to see, like, what what's Jerry learning at school? Like, play us a little something. And uh, when Jerry sits down to play the piano, it just sounds like there's... It says it sounded like a little kid pounding away on the keys as hard as he could, right? So just like a, just somebody like punching the keys, and he says, and they're like, "Give us a break!" And he says, "I'm not doing it. It isn't me." And that happens a few times. Yes, of course they don't believe Which, him. Why would you? Right, this kid loves to fall. Yeah, yeah, he's a jokester. But that's the part about jokestering that I appreciated in this book. They made him a jokester, which is so like, all right, we get it, but. Um, that just gives a little bit more to the parents to the point where their kid's freaking out and they don't immediately say like, hey, you're not acting yourself. This move may not be good for you. Yeah. But him being a jokester and him like being like, it's haunted. Oh, the piano. Yeah. And like just that he was already trying to do like sick grinds off the thing. And they're yeah. like, you, you know, but they still jump from bullshit to we should be concerned way faster than any supporting character yeah. in any Goosebumps book. It's responsible. So after that, he gets sent up to his room. So whatever. He goes back to um, the the studio, whatever you call it. The spooky school. Spooky school. And he goes and sees Mr. Toggle. And he goes into like a gymnasium-sized place of just inventions. Yeah. Um, at that point, he says he invented a saxophone that toots itself. Mm-hmm. And then on his way out... He hears, help me, and, like, please help me coming from, like, boxes and stuff. Yeah. And he says that they're just old, unusable parts and failed inventions and whatnot. Yeah. Um, that happens in the same chapter uh, as him getting home. His buddy, Kim Lee, comes over. So pretty cool for Jerry. Way to go. Um, they have some nice hot chocolate. It's very sweet. It's a very sweet gathering for jerry she she understands his um sarcasm and jokes too yeah yeah so they like they they have a really good rapport yeah and it's it reminds me of so i don't you've never been on dating apps no you you solved it with producer chip you like (laughs) made it work but right uh one thing is that like most people most girls if you're a girl listening to this which sorry uh, Sorry that you're listening to this. Because you're listening to us just be like, my dick does <laughs> this. And you're like, my dick does this. And then we both giggle. Yes. But Accurate. Uh, every, I'd say 75% of all girls on dating apps are fluent in sarcasm. Mm-hmm. Well, that, they have to be, right? That's like, at minimum, they should be because I'm sure it's a fucking cesspool for them. Yeah, but, like, it sucks, and it sucks, too, because, like, fluent and sarcasm, but then people are just, like, 
my dick does. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy because we're saying it in jest, but other people are just like, you should see what the my balls do. Right, because they're expecting, <laughs> like, yeah, they're going to get that message, and then they're not going to respond, obviously, because why yeah. the fuck would you do that? And then within... 15 minutes they'll get another message that says like stuck up bitch won't answer my ball text pretty much because they're like this is my favorite office quote and the other guy's just like at least two fingers in my asshole tomorrow <laughs> where are you and they're like uh hi yeah yeah anyway um i don't even know how we got there but... uh, i think that <laughs> i don't know that the dip, one of the dating apps was invented by mr toggle <laughs> Toggle right. If you like his noggle. Yeah, it's called Toggle My Dongle. <laughs> uh, so when he's dating Kim in his house and drinking white hot chocolate, um, he mentions Dr. Shriek again. And Kim Lee kind of expands on why she's so freaked out and says there are some stories about the Shriek school. Um, for example, there are monsters there. Uh, Jerry says, debunked, like it's just this weird inventor which is not really better um, because it makes no sense. Um, And then she also says, well, kids just vanish and disappear. And then they decide like, well, you know, this story, it's a game of telephone. Like it's probably, how could it be true? He, um, that same night, here's the piano again. Goes down. She confirms basically what was said by Kim. And, so, and then shows her hands while she's playing piano. Oh, yeah. And she ain't got she no She ain't got no hands. She shows her stumps. Yep. So Jerry loses it and his parents say, you know what? Piano may not be for you. Yeah. This is the second night we like woke up to you screaming in front of a piano. You're <laughs> going to quit after this lesson. What a funny image. Yeah. To just find him so, shrieking at a piano. And but But the parents are still like, you know what? We only paid for one more lesson. Just go tell the man, be polite, and just leave. Right. If only it worked for him. So he conceded to do this. He shows up. He. This is the the tactical decision here to tell Mr. Shriek, Dr. Shriek first, that he, this is going to be his last Bullshit. lesson. Do it last, man. Do it. That's exactly on your way out what the door. Thinking. Come on. The fuck, man. But he opens with it. He says, this will be my last lesson. I've decided I have to quit. And this is where things turn on a dime, right? He says, no, you're not leaving, Jerry. Um, Not with those hands. His face twisted into an ugly snarl. You can't quit, Jerry. I need those beautiful hands. Things escalate from here. Dr. Shriek um, chases him into some big ass, another auditorium. It's like a, oh, they call it a recital hall. Um, and there's a ton of pianos in there. It says, I saw row after row of black pianos beside each piano stood a smiling instructor. The instructors all looked alike. They were all bobbing their heads in time to the music. The music was being played by, and then there's an M dash there. And then it's, it was being played by another M dash. I gasped staring from row to row. The music was being played by M dash hands. All caps. I tell (laughs) Yes. Human hands floating over the keyboards. No people attached, just hands. And again, all caps italicized. So, real talk. When you heard him saying that, did you think of uh, Speed by any chance? <laughs> no. The movie, the movie no, Speed? No, it's been too long. I, I wouldn't know. Do uh, they scream hands? So we, we, no, but we, we all know the main character. The, well, the, it's a... Uh, there was a, Our boy, a John Wick prequel. Mr. Matrix. Mm-hmm. And you ever see the scene where he they hit the baby carriage? Um, I mean, I have, but... And it was a homeless person, and cans fly out. And he goes, cans! Oh. <laughs> it was only cans! <laughs> <laughs> the homeless person says that? No, uh, our boy, Keanu Mr. Reeves? Matrix, yells that. Keanu Reeves goes, cans! It was only cans! John Quick, am I right? Yeah, that's Sweet. right. But I thought of that the whole time. So, creepy, you walk in and you get what you get on the cover. Thanks, Mr. Tim Jacobus. That's right. It's a cool cover. Cool cover. It's a... I think the title is more... It's badass. ...synonymous with Goosebumps than the cover itself. Yeah. Great. Really, really good cover. Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. Awesome. It's cool. 
Also, if uh, you were part of the New Jersey, New York hardcore scene, 2005-2006, you may have listened to Dr. Acula, uh, well known because their first album, and even some of the later ones I learned, just used Goosebumps titles for their songs, and probably the number one ripper at that time was Piano Lessons Can Be Murdered. There you go. So we'll see what it comes to that, but... Um, yeah, so runs in, getting chased, yep. turns around, realizes everything that's going on, and who's there to save him but Mr. Toggle. That's right. And he toggles off Dr. Shriek, which, yeah. listeners, does not mean he jacks him off. It means <laughs> he turns him off, literally. So Dr. Shriek is a robot. Uh, he's one of his Just inventions. another invention. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, his best invention, he says. Right, but here's the thing. All, yeah, no, sorry, go ahead. The hands also stop playing. The hands stop playing. So he has control over everything in the room. Um, so, I mean, that's a sign, right? Like, not normal, get out of there. Um, but Jerry yeah. finds relief in this. And, um, the, you know, Dr. Shriek just passes the buck, right? So this is a, I was going to say, it's an Iron Man 3 situation, I don't want to spoil Iron Man 3 for you guys, but it's been a while. But it's like the villain yeah. is not the villain. Um, and which is good. That's the nuance of this book actually that I like. But I think this is where, as we say all the time, it just very quickly turns. But it's still cool. Um, you know, Dr. Toggle now wants his hands, right? So he needs his hands. This is the my one point of contention in the book that I'll kind of stick with that is just kind of bullshit that RL just like had to come up with something on the spot. He was like, um, Dr. Toggle says, well, I'm, I'm such a good inventor and I've like done all this shit and I made Dr. Shriek by the way, who has hands. Um, but for some reason I can't make human hands. They're too complex. So I need to actually take hands. Well, I thought of it that Dr. Shriek has someone else's right. hands. Yeah, he could, but still like, yo, you made like a man with a mustache and like <laughs> right also why'd you make him fat <laughs> why'd you make him santa well i thought about it too he made him santa claus which is like was... santa exactly i thought about it and i'm like wow even that the the foreshadowing right. of it is pretty good it is is this does this perpetuate like old imperialism where we're like assuming everyone should be practicing christianity what about the Jewish kids? <laughs> I didn't what think about, about the Muslim that. kids? Come on. Yeah. Um, so at this point, he says, yeah, but I'm going to need your hands. That's when we learn that Mr. Toggle uh, loves music and he wants perfect music without the um, failure of human. Right. No human error. The, just the human beautiful side. music. No human error. And he just wants that. So I wrote down here that uh, so Mr. Toggle's a tone hound. He's a tone he, out. He's dialing he in those wants, pedals. Yeah, he he really can't get a recording. He needs live performance. Yeah. He needs everything to be perfect. He's got it all set up. Um, one thing stops, though. As Jerry is l trying to run and leave out of this auditorium, our lady ghost just pops right out of the ground. and She just says, bye, bitch. That's right. Dave, I want to tell you, I was excited about this. Me too. I liked it. Me too. Um, Real good. And it's not just her. She actually has the power to raise her own little army of the dead. So there's like ghosts that appear at each piano and help to uh, basically murder Dr. To Mr. Toggle. Um, In a cool way. Kind yeah. of reminiscent of uh, Haunted Mask. Yeah. So <laughs> Jerry watches as they carry him into the deep woods beside the school. It says Mr. Toggle appeared to be floating, floating into the deep woods beside the school. The hands carried him away. He disappeared into the tangled trees. Then there's a beat. I knew he'd never be seen again. <laughs> yeah. So the hands, the ghosts acquire their hands again and the flying hands just hold him down, yeah. then drag him out of the school and just pull him into the woods. Drag him, bitch. Uh, then the book <laughs> ends where he he's just like, well, everything went back to normal after a while. I didn't have to play uh, anymore. We sold the piano. Everything seemed to be fine. Yeah. We guess the ghost left. Yeah. Uh, I'm playing baseball now, and people, uh, I'm good at catching and throwing, and people say I have good hands. Right. Nice little quip at the end. Whatever. It's which is it's fine. fine. It was like a real letdown kind of thing. It was. I thought of it in like video games 
where like at the end it's like Resident Evil and everything's fucking crazy and you're in the helicopter yeah. and then you see each other and you're like, wow, that was crazy. Yeah. Can't wait to take a shower and then it's like the end. Right, yeah, yeah. But it was it was good. It's good. Listen, when you have an ending like Camp Nightmare where it's actually you're an alien in space, this um, is leaps and bounds better. It was, and I really didn't expect it to be good. I didn't either. That was what was so surprising. I think the meat of this book is good. I think the ghost is the scariest, perhaps the scariest thing we've encountered so far. Um, you know, at the end, I'll talk about in bad writing, there's some over-explanation about the ghost, but when of she course, appears yeah. here and there, it's like, it's great. Um, so you want to go into the good writing? Yeah, sure. You want to? I feel like we've talked about a lot of these as we were going through, yeah. but... Do you want to start off? Uh, sure. Um, I think I already talked about the spooky snowfall that happens on page 33. I just like that description. Um, mm-hmm. And then the ghost description <clears throat> that we've talked about at length, the first time he actually physically sees the woman is great. Um, I think, um, oh, when Dr. Fry, he goes to see Dr. Fry. I think that's done really well. This is chapter 13. Um, so the previous chapter ends um, with, you know, one of these supernatural occurrences um, where Jerry's p- trying to play the piano, but it just sounds like pounding. And mom's like, stop doing that. And he says, I'm not doing it. Then the chapter ends. And chapter 13 says, Dr. Fry's office wasn't the way I pictured a psychiatrist's office. It was small and bright. The walls were yellow and there were colorful pictures of parrots and toucans and other birds hanging all around. Like it just goes into like, here's the scene. Now you're in it, you know, and that doesn't, RL doesn't do that a lot. He'll, he'll describe like the trip to the, like they'll walk to the car and then they'll get in the car. They'll have a conversation with mom in the car on the way to the office, yeah. like all this kind of shit. Um, but we're just there. And I like that introduction. It is, he's, he's, he's so he's actually showing, not telling for once. Yeah. Um, um, that's kind of it for my my good. Outside of just the general note that I I did like the book. Uh, I like the subtle descriptions. I think that really made the difference in this book for me. Yeah. Um, like for example, the dad is being his like uh, white Dave Chappelle yeah. and just being like, "Do you know what time it is?" And like, dad looks at his wrist and he doesn't have the watch on, so he just looks back up and he's like, "It's the middle of the night." Right. He's like, "Do you know what time it is?" He looks down. And he's like, "Oh fuck." Uh, just little things like it's so late and stuck in your ways. Um, I loved when they described the sound of the house and sleeping in a new room. Yeah. Which is such a big thing. Uh, just not being used to those sounds. Um, I loved the cornflakes rule from hungover drunk sounding mom. I feel like mom was like hungover at nights and stuff in the mornings. But it says, uh, how come I have to have cornflakes? I grumbled. Mushing the spoon around in the bowl. You know the rules, she said, frowning. Junk cereals only on weekends. Stupid rule, I muttered. I think <laughs> cornflakes is a junk cereal. <laughs> <laughs> nice, sick burn on Kellogg's. Uh, so that was pretty good. Um, I think 34, page 34. Let me run through my smelly book. There's really good pacing and suspense um, when it came to like the playing of the piano upstairs. And anytime the piano is playing and they're making their way through it, uh, through the house, yeah. it paces it out really good. That was just the first time I noticed it. Um, there was a great burn against the dad when he always tries to over-explain things. He's just like uh, talking about like ghosts. Listen, Jerry, I know this house might seem old and scary, and uh, I know how hard it is for you to leave your friends behind and move away. Dad, please, I interrupted, but he kept going. The house is just old, Jerry. Old and a little run down, but uh, that doesn't mean it's haunted. These ghosts of yours, don't you see? They're really your fears coming out. And then he says, uh, Dad was a psychology major in college. <laughs> Which I thought was so good. It says a lot. He's like, Dad, shut the fuck up. He's like, oh, this. he's like, yeah, Dad was a yeah. psychology major in college. Yeah, so he, he went thinks to he fucking knows everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Such a good burn. Um, and that's like definitely RLS. Yeah. Um, on 51st page, I love that, uh, talking about the ghost, her eyes were closed, her lips formed a sad smile. Yeah. Sad smile. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Really cool. 
Uh, I liked when he is outside of the school and it says that the piano music, it's like a roar, like the ocean crashing around him. Yeah. And then um, at the end when the ghost is talking and says that it was just uh, her voice was only a hiss of air. Oh, yeah. As like a whisper. Um, once we get to see that the instructors are also robots, the instructors were all bald-headed men in gray suits with smiles plastered on their faces. Their heads bobbed and swayed. Their gray eyes opened and closed as the hands played over the keyboard. Just kind of this... It reminded me... You ever watch Courage the Cowardly Dog? No, but I know the character. I thought of like the animation like that show. Real cool. And then on page 123, what culminated uh, all of the writing and all of the great sound description, I think this was very powerful, how it just goes, uh, the piano music had ended, ellipsis, forever. Yeah, I did. I and noticed just that. saying, yeah, the hall stretched <laughs> behind me in an eerie silence, ghostly silence. Yeah. It's just there's been sound, and the sound was such a strong descriptor for the entire book. Once it's finally quiet and it all ends, he has a lot to say about it, and... It's great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. To counter that, <clears throat> there's some bad. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I'll just blow through mine real quick. <clears throat> um, page two, we, we start this habit of using this phrase, drop her teeth or drop one's teeth. Yes, I wrote about that as well. Yeah. Um, so it says, Mom just stood in the doorway, her mouth hanging open. I really thought she was going to drop her teeth, exclamation point. Also happens on page 21 and 95. Yes, it does three <clears throat> times. I will compound that by saying too many exclamation points. There's just a general mm -hmm. note that this book uses them perhaps more than any other book in the series. Um, page six... It says um, there's like some burp shit with Sean who like never appears again. But Sean is Jerry's best friend. Um, Dad doesn't like Sean because he's noisy and likes to burp real loud. I don't know what the fuck that <laughs> meant. Like, I, I just don't know what that detail does for us. Um, uh, I only dislike that because I want more Sean because he sounds fucking <laughs> dope. He sounds like a badass. Um, there are, there's some of the shit we talked about last book, like the foreshadowing by telling us, you know, exactly like, you know, by just saying like, this is foreshadowing dot, dot, dot. I had no idea it happens on page eight, like how weird things would get. <clears throat> um, yeah. page 26, I was wrong, uh, very wrong. And also on page 31, <clears throat> page 27, uh, this is when, um, Dr. Shriek comes over for the first time and it says um, he wore a long puffy red coat and had bushy white hair from this distance he sort of looked like Santa Claus he walked very stiffly as if his knees weren't good arthritis or something I guessed so I don't know about you when you were 12 but <laughs> Stein is saying that this 12 year old clocks this guy's arthritis from a distance of like 20 meters <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a few things like that too. It's um, about outdated dad terms that he uses. Right. It's it's strange. Um, the shriek conflict escalates really quickly. It seems kind of perfunctory. Um, I when I read page one eleven, Jerry going into the rehearsal hall and seeing all the hands. I I read it with all the M dashes and it's his hands. There's obviously no subtlety there. It's just it yeah. actually takes away from the moment. But again, this is what we're talking about where there's gonna be over explanation in this book. That's just what he does. It's a book series for kids, but it's worth mentioning. Also, mm -hmm. um over explanation of the ghost backstory on page 122. I like the ghost just appearing and melting and saying like I was a victim of the school. That's plenty. Um, but it says, I tried to warn you. She called over Mr. Toggle's frantic screams. I tried to scare you away. I lived in your house. I was a victim of this school. Like this shit is clear, right? She has no hands. She already said that she went to the school and obviously is in his house. Um, and it says, I tried to frighten you from becoming a victim too. And then it says, call for help. The ghost is imploring him to call for help. Not a very cool ghost. I mean, it is a cool ghost, but it's just like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, um, something about that. I read, uh, one of the video games, like the phone game or something, the piano, there are pianos that are actually, 
it says that it's made by uh, Shriek and Toggle. Like, that's the company. Really? So maybe that the inventions of that piano that's, like, haunted is, like, put out there by them. Okay. That's cool. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that's just something they, they added to the lore later. Yeah, yeah. But is that all That's all, all I got, yeah. Um, I just said that some details shoehorned into the beginning. Like on page 19, Monday morning, I woke up very early. My cat clock with the moving tail and eyes wasn't unpacked yet. (laughs) Just like little stuff like that goes through. The dad terms, uh, they don't really talk about the boxes that were um, being unpacked from their previous house. They're all called cartons. Oh, yeah. That's weird. Like throughout the entire book over and over again. It reminds me of like mummy case instead of sarcophagus. Why are you avoiding this word? Yeah. Um... He talks about music groups instead of, like, bands. Right. Yeah, it's a dad thing. It's like, maybe I can play in a rock and roll music group. Right. Also, the whole time he wants to learn how to play rock piano, and he's like, can I learn some rock and roll piano? That's right, yeah. Maybe some rock and roll, uh, like, riffs or whatever. And all of that was like, that's so weird it to me. Weird. Like, he wants to be Billy Joel so I was so just going to say, yeah. But it makes sense when this book was originally written about a guitar. Yeah. So that I allowed. Uh, well, I mean, who who the fuck am I? But uh, I understood. Also, there's a point where it got cold and he was just like, oh, maybe it may, it may be time for mom and dad to turn on the furnace. <laughs> like things like that where it's like right. it just didn't seem like even a 90s kid yeah. kind of talk, which was fine, though, because like I said, this book was real good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Talked about the three times they thought they were going to drop their teeth. Mm-hmm. Uh, on 37, reminiscent of the last book, we got another like weird Martian. Oh, is there thing. more Martian stuff? My parents were both staring at me as if I were oh, a Martian. Oh, that's right, yeah. Which took away from the scene where they find him screaming in front of a piano. It did. And it's like, I guess... they looked at me like I was a Martian, and it's just like, no, you are screaming, and yeah. you're their child. That's way more powerful I, than anything else you can say. I guess I was just glad they didn't use an exclamation point on that sentence. But yeah. it's bad. Yeah. All right. Cool. So let's do that That final final. So what's your t- top spook and scare? I, Dave, I think for both of us, it's the first appearance of the ghost when she melts, right? Yeah, her fucking face turns into clay I mean, and runs down her fucking nightgown. Yeah. And just, he, Jerry shits his goddamn pants. Yeah. It's, uh, it's wild. It's like um, the Holy Grail, right? It's like when he picks up it's the awesome. Holy Grail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't have to read it again. Um, who's your best dressed? Uh, the ghost. The ghost? That's a good call, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I did uh, Dr. Shriek only because of this description on page 27 when we first meet him. Uh, So, you know, he looks like Santa. He wore a a white shirt that was coming untucked around his big belly and baggy gray pants. But it was this line. I stepped forward and shook hands with him. His hand was red and kind of spongy. Um, (laughs) That's just weird. It's just gross. Like, it's visceral. I I don't like it. Um, So that stuck with me. I just like that they describe uh, the ghost like she's super proud of her skull face and (laughs) stump. And then she's like, she shows, she shows off her stump hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was just like, ta-da! And I was like, you know what? You go, girl. Right, yeah. Have those stump hands. proud. Yeah. Okay, alt title. Um, I just wrote hand stuff. Like, (laughs) it's not my most inspired work, but uh, it's what popped into mind. How about you? Um, I was thinking of something like a mystery. Okay. Uh, like, you know, like the great caper, the great, like the, the bank heist, the bank job, like, so maybe like, like, and it's just like, (sighs) Uh Oh, did I ruin it? Yeah. (laughs) We can edit that out. I was going to say, uh, yeah. Uh, Jerry Fingers, the great hand job was <laughs> going to be mine. It's great. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> just keep it all. You, you just, I mean, it would have been good. But <laughs> we're good, too, we, we, we're too like-minded. That's fine. Well, that's, that's that. I guess. Fuck. All right. Yeah, I really took the wind out of your sails there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I guess. Fuck. Cool, though. All right. Cool. Cool. 
Um, so what else we got? We got any reviews? Oh, we we do, but we're looking at my phone, so I can't read them. I have something. Can I can right. I do a quick segment to lead us out? Yeah. Um, let's call it um, internet reader reviews. So this will be where uh, I find on the internet someone who had a lukewarm reaction to the book, and uh, I'm going to share it with you because I think it's funny. Is that good? <laughs> yeah, let's do All it. All right, cool. So this, I'm just going to kind of drop in to the middle of the review here. It says, Dr. Shriek goes berserk and insists that he needs Jerry's hands, grabbing his wrist to force him to stay. Well, I see he took it well. Wait, dot, dot, dot. He wants, dot, 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 his hands. Uh, pedo much? <laughs> Jerry runs off and... Pedo, pedo means fart in Spanish. Does it? Do people say pedo or pedo when they abbreviate oh, pedophile? Oh, I don't know. It depends if it's like a, a British thing. I don't, so pedo, I, guess, I don't know. Who Maybe. says that, you know? Pedo, my, um, yeah. Jerry runs off and stumbles into the school's auditorium. Jerry runs inside and sees row after row of black pianos, each with a head-nodding instructor, and each piano being played by human hands, but only human hands. And in the book, hands is in huge text. Yeah, I get it, Stein. Mr. Toggle bursts into the room and saves Jerry by turning off Dr. Shriek with a remote. It turns out Dr. Shriek was a robot. Okay, I didn't see that one coming. Then uh, in all bold, in between two asterisks, it says earlier in the book, and this is the guy who wrote this review. It says, Jerry, colon. He says, you are a genius. Toggle, colon. I programmed him to say that. Heh. <laughs> and then he writes, subtle. Jerry tries to leave, but Mr. Toggle stops him. I need your hands. Oh, God, not him too. Um, that's kind of it. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's definitely more, but the, the lines that are the funniest are kind of between a lot of, uh, summary. Uh, at the end though, it says <clears throat> twist ending. He joins the baseball team. I'm pretty good. Everyone says I have good hands. And then in all caps, it says everyone is a pedo robot. That's it. Yeah. I mean, if we ever sound like that, Please sound off in the comments. Just below let us know that it's time to end the podcast. Yeah. We want to give him credit where credit's due, so. Right. Yeah. And like Pedo in Spanish, mm-hmm. I wish you all a good night and a fine. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that NAFTA from Dave. <laughs> <laughs> from nafta my balls have a good life (laughs) see you dummies see you dummies all right goodbye